Hi, this is Pat Moorhead, and we are live here at VMware Explorer 2023, and I'm here with my incredible co-host, Daniel Newman. Dan, how you doing? Good morning from Las Vegas. Been a while since we've been here for a conference. Days, minutes, weeks. I, I know, what is it? Maybe it's been a month, and I think we're gonna be back here uh, two times more here in Vegas. But listen, this is part of the analyst grind. We go to events, we write stuff, we get up, we do videos like this, but um, I digress. No, uh, one thing I'm really impressed about at every Explorer, and I think this is my 10th as, a, as an industry analyst, uh, I came here when I was uh, with those other companies a couple ah. times, but I'm always impressed at the ecosystem uh, uh, activity around it. And, and whether it's uh, backup software and restore on the VMware platform, whether it's storage, or uh, you have ship makers as well who uh, are adding an incredible amount of value. In fact, and we've joked on this about the show, uh, you can't run software on oxygen or air uh, or air uh you need semiconductors and we both thought semiconductors were cool before a lot of other people caught on to that yeah we definitely did and vmware does have a very impressive ecosystem if you kind of look at where the cloud is heading yeah. and you look at what's going on in the industry uh ai obviously is in vogue uh of course you need to be able to power those data centers and the ability to move data, you know, cloud to edge, edge to cloud, and of course, the entire ecosystem of running our enterprise apps, Pat, the chip makers are always gonna be near and dear to our heart. And of course, you and I love talking about this. So maybe we bring on our guest. Yeah, let's do that. Uh, I would say, I mean, these are just the facts, folks. Uh, more VMware workloads operate on Intel than any other processor out there uh, on the planet. With that, we'd like to introduce Chris from Intel. Chris, how you doing? Doing great this morning. Thanks for having me. Yeah, first time guest on the 6.5. Not the first person from Intel on the 6.5. In fact, uh, your fearless leader, Pat Gelsinger, and a lot of his, uh, uh, the SLT, uh, was, was on the 6.5 and continues to be on the 6.5. So it's great to have you. Absolutely. Yeah. Love being here. Love talking about our, our partnership and our work with VMware. I think you probably also think that semiconductors are cool too. Absolutely, I'm second generation uh, semiconductor. By I love it. I love it. Well, listen, let's start off talking a little bit about kind of the, you know, tr the move of AI. So it's kind of there's a lot of discussion about how it's being moved from sort of the traditional core CPU to accelerators. Intel, of course, one of the largest semiconductor companies in the world, has to have a story right now around AI and how this is happening in the in the migration. How does this? narrative kind of fit the Intel story right now? It fits great. It's exactly how we're investing. So we've got a two-part investment. So one part is on discrete accelerators. So these are parts like our Gaudi 2 and our Mac series uh, GPUs, which are discrete uh, accelerators to focus on AI. And then we've been making generation over generation, we've been adding AI accelerators directly into the Xeon chip uh, for each generation. Yeah, so what is it about putting, a, a lot of people don't know, and again, I just get back to stats and facts, more AI is done on a CPU than any other piece of silicon that's out there. And a lot of it has to do with the flexibility. Uh, a lot of it also has to do with those resources aren't always moving, but there's also certain workloads that <clears throat> need lower latency and a certain level. Uh, but is this the main reason that, that Intel puts AI accelerators into its Xeon processors? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So the answer is, is yes, because if you look at how did VMware and Intel start working together, virtualization, it gave flexibility in the workload. Right, remember, it was gonna take down the entire market. Exactly. Right? <laughs> and then it just, it, the market just went crazy. Exactly, it yeah. created a virtuous cycle of growth exactly. because you had all this flexible compute. So that's the idea behind putting the accelerators really access accessible inside the virtual machine is you can flex between any workload. You don't have any stranded resources by having purely dedicated uh, resources that are focused on a certain area. So kind of the whole idea of AI and the accelerator tends to be about matching workloads to silicon. And as part of your strategy, Chris, I'd kind of, you know, I'd just love to 
kind of hear how you tell that story is which workloads is Intel focusing on as it pertains to the opportunities for acceleration? Yeah, so when you, when you look at like some of these giant multimodal workloads, like what ChatGPT was created around with, you know, rumors pushing a trillion uh, parameters, those require dedicated GPUs uh, to go crunch through that kind of, kind of work. Very expensive, very time consuming, a lot of power involved. So when you're, when you're creating that kind of model, great. That is, you need that kind of workhorse for it. Cor now let's move over to corporations. If you look at actual corporate database size, most are under a terabyte. Most are actually about 500 gigabytes, not that big. And it's not multimodal. You don't have 8K, a bunch of 8K video you're trying to correlate with last quarter sales, uh, SKUs, et cetera. So putting that, where, that type of uh, capability where the corporate data is just makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it totally does. And, and, and we've seen recommendation uh, engines um, that don't necessarily require, don't require discrete GPU, even for inference, uh, be very capable of doing this. I mean, there's a reason when you go on your, pick your favorite e-commerce site, uh, they've been doing AI on, on the CPU for pretty much forever since, uh, since day one. So uh, technologically, you know, I've been tracking, gosh, Intel has been doing Accelerator since the uh, 486DX, mm -hmm. okay? I'll call the math coprocessor an Accelerator. Saw MMX, SSC, flavors of that, AVX, and then multiple variants of that. Can you talk about um, which uh, Accelerators you have in there today? Yeah, so, uh, uh, you know, recently in our last generation, we had Deal Boost, which... Uh, Helped with uh, you know with base technologies, uh, including AVX five twelve, uh, VNNI, and those were AI accelerators. And what we put in this uh, this fourth uh, generation Xeon scalable is something called Advanced Matrix Ex Extensions (AMX), and it has a matrix multiply function with big cache in front of it, and that's exactly what's required for generative AI, uh, and it's perfect for generative AI uh, inferencing, and it's even powerful enough to fine tune models. So you could have up to a 10 billion parameter model and easily fine tune it on, on a Xeon cluster. Well, that is really the key when it comes to corporations in, in particular, right? They're not gonna be training a 70 billion parameter model themselves. They might, you know, take a llama or choose your, uh, anything on Hugging Face mm -hmm. or most on Hugging Face, uh, pull that down and mass prompting or grounding I think yes. the, uh, the term is, uh, which is to uh, saturate uh, proprietary data off of that model that is, uh, increases its accuracy, its position, and decreases the amount of um, uh, skew uh, uh, that it has, or when it makes stuff up, essentially. Is that, is that what we're talking about here? Yeah, absolutely. So if you go take, uh, let's say, Llama 2, we actually have this demo at the, at the show here, uh, seven billion uh, parameter model. You, in, uh, we're showing it fine tune on Alpaca because that's a public data set uh, around the finance one. So imagine you're a financial company. You don't want to put your data into the open source ecosystem. It's highly protected. You want to keep your IP. It's regulated. And we we ran it on a four node uh, Xeon cluster, fine tuned Llama two to focus on finance. So it would have things like IRR, NPV. Uh, you know, a future or a forward means something different in finance than just chat GPT might initially spit out. And we did this uh, on a 7 billion parameter with four Xeon, four node uh, cluster in three and a half hours. So you could easily just flex your compute to that. And that's the fine tuning. And then running inference, you could just easily run the inference and uh, 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 not strand resources using that, those capabilities. That's probably the best example, aside from maybe a certain SaaS company that I've heard of using private data in a, in a very narrow, narrow space do that. By the way, I didn't, this is the first time learned, even analysts learn, this is the first time that I knew you could do that big of a model on, on Xeon, so it's impressive. Yeah, I think the, the interesting thing is it'll keep circling and we'll hear about big GPUs, big GPUs, big GPUs. It's in both. But the, the truth is, is like we found so many times in history, 
phases. The workloads will determine. And meaning in this early phase where, Chris, we're trying to train these massive models, there is a need and there is a capacity. The runway for that's going to be, it's a little bit non-determined right now. And as we see the accelerators, CPUs, in some cases FPGAs, different technologies become applied to certain AI requirements, we'll find that the mix will change and the AI will revert. I mean, I remember watching you know, some of the stuff DL Boost did on SAP years ago and you were going, you know, you have what you need right now for most, for many of these kind of acceleration requirements. But I think a lot of people, they want it to be binary, Chris. They want it yeah. to be GPU or CPU. And I think even, you know, other companies have shown that their most advanced technology is a GPU, CPU combination. Having said that though, people want the comparison. So talk about like when you're comparing Intel's acceleration and the AMX strategy to the GPU, how do you, sort of compare where you know one makes sense and where the other makes sense. Yeah, so when you start getting uh, in the double digit, uh, you know, above 10 billion parameters, you know, you're up 50 billion plus, you want to look at a de de dedicated GPU, especially, you know, generative AI is the big thing in vogue right now. Uh, so this is where like our Gaudi 2 uh, is very relevant. And to train them, to do the initial training on those models, absolutely, you need dedicated uh, GPU resources, especially when you get like multimodal data, you're trying to correlate pictures to a large language model or video. Uh, you know, we've all seen you enter in the verbal prompts and you can go create uh, yes. pictures. Uh, uh, that, that kind of stuff takes, you know, uh, pr pretty heavy compute resources to create the initial model. But fine tuning in a lot of cases, you see the number of parameters shrinks very rapidly uh, once you know and target the use case. And a lot of enterprises, when they when they enter that segment, it starts to become data security, governance, all those kinds of things, and their tar and their market segment has many much more focused requirements. I think that's a really good way to look at it. Um, let's shift to software. So, okay. over thirty years in this in this business, right? I, I like to I I think history is important. History doesn't always find the future, but you need to really look at what's changed. And one of the biggest things is software and the importance uh, as it relates to semiconductors. Now, software was always important. Uh, and I think x86 and compatibility showed that this was true. In the AI world and, and acceleration, it is a different game. Now, you still need uh, some sort of ISA to boot the system and run the application, but as we saw with your special instructions, does require a special way to do software. And whether it's ML, DL, generative AI, it, it starts with, let's say, a framework or a model, okay? Can you talk about how Intel supports software, certain frameworks uh, for AI? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, one is we believe in an open ecosystem. So, you know, we've been in compilers and libraries for a long time. and as computers become more heterogeneous, you know, as you build out data center, hybrid cloud, multi-cloud, you're gonna have all kinds of uh, compute accelerators yeah. in that ecosystem. And uh, what we're trying to build is one set of software tools that will give you best performance for that heterogeneous compute ecosystem, starting at the compiler, uh, through the libraries, and then we'll have optimized you know, versions of uh, PyTorch, TensorFlow, et cetera. And then on top of that, we work with the application companies uh, to, to work through that. It's the same thing when we contribute to the open source communities all the way through the software stack up through the application layer. So there, there's tools and we have a huge investment on software for, okay, I know if I, I you pick this suite of software, it'll run, my, everything will run best. And you know, you talked about uh, frameworks, libraries, compilers. How about these new, um, I, I, it's funny, large language models are for language. I like to refer to them more as foundational models where it's text, it's code, it's pictures, it's videos, it's, it's audio. So uh, are, is Intel engaged with these large model makers as well? Yeah, abs absolutely. And uh, we, uh, we work with, um, both several companies are generating that. And the biggest place, the biggest repository of the libraries is Hugging Face. And we have a very close relationship uh, with Hugging Face. And you can just type Intel Hugging Face and you can see 
readily accessible, all the all the ready to go models uh, to use. Perfect. Good, good answer. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we got to wrap up here in just a minute, but before we go, any other big VMware, you know, explore focal areas for Intel? Yeah, we're we're very excited uh, with our partnership with with VMware because we're just prolific across all the enterprises and it's really push button access to turn on AI in your existing footprint. And we add your fourth gen Xeon, it just becomes all that more powerful. And we've worked extensively with VMware for that compatibility to make it easy for everyone uh, to use and get the benefits. I just want to thank you so much for joining us here at VMware Explorer 2023 in Las Vegas. It's great to talk to you. AI is red hot and it's good to kind of hear this whole continuum from you. And Intel has a story. And I think it's really important that the market hears it. You know, I know there's been a lot of rotation um, to thinking it's all about the GPU. Hopefully here on the 6.5, we provide a little bit of clarity to the market that there's going to be a different subset of semiconductors that are going to be really important for all the different kinds of AI workloads. And Chris, you did a really good job breaking it down today. All right, thanks. Happy to be here. Thanks. All right, everybody, hit that subscribe button. We had a number of videos right here at VMware Explorer 2023. But of course, subscribe and join and watch all of the 6.5 episodes. Patrick and I appreciate your support. But for now, we got to say goodbye. We'll see you all later.